Welcome to another Wednesday afternoon on the NSE. Um, today is the Brooklyn Rails 1012th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and today I have the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation with Jordan Stein and Chloe Stagaman. And now I'll introduce today's guest and host. Jordan Stein is a curator and writer based in San Francisco. He is the author of Miyoko Ito, Heart of Hearts, and Rip Tales, Jay DeFeo's Estocada and Other Pieces. In 2017, he founded Cushion Works, an exhibition space in the Mission District that aims to link past and present through the varied presentation of critical and often overlooked artworks, histories, and ideas. He has independently organized exhibitions at venues such as the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, Artist Space, and the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago, where he formerly served as curator of special projects. And our host today, Chloe Stagaman, is a Brooklyn-based curator, and we are so, so lucky to have her as the director of programs here at the Brooklyn Rail. Thanks so, so much to you both for being here, and I'll pass it over to you, Chloe, to get us started. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for that introduction. And thank you, of course, to the Rail team, who I'm really lucky to work with each day on this program. I'm completely honored to be in conversation with curator and writer Jordan Stein today about a project many years in the making, Miyoko Ito, Heart of Hearts, the first book dedicated to the life and work of American artist Miyoko Ito, born in 1918, um, and Miyoko passed away in 1983. The book was published by Prieco Press last year, and it's a force in its scope, its achievement, and in its resonance. Um, I'll start by admitting that due to living abroad, I did not encounter Miyoko Ito's work until her show at Matthew Mark's gallery early last year in 2023. And like many others, I was completely astonished by her colors, her compositions, and the degree to which her built, carefully constructed worlds inspired such deep contemplations on indeterminability, as well as moving ruminations on psychological and emotional possibility. And from my experience, Ito's artworks catalyze an immediate and insatiable desire to learn more about Miyoko Ito. I had the pleasure of attending the launch of Miyoko Ito Heart of Hearts earlier this year at Artist Space, where I felt this feeling confirmed. The organization was dotted so densely with people, some unable to see your slideshow, Jordan, but packed like sardines, eager to listen to Miyoko's story, to hear more about her work, and to hear about your work, gathering photographs of her artworks over the past several years. And so first, I would like to thank you and to thank Matt Connors for this gift of a book. Uh, the enormous effort and persistence it took to bring it to life and to give you a chance to say hello. Hi, hi. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks for that totally beautiful introduction. Thanks, Eleanor and everyone at The Rail for having me. And um, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. It's a total pleasure. So I want to start. I'm going to share screens so that everyone can see the cover of the book. Um, I want to start with the cover of the book. Um, the cover is an artwork called Island in the Sun uh, from 1978 by Miyoko Ito. Um, and this work has enormous personal significance to you um, and is tells a story of your first intersection with Miyoko Ito's practice and work. And I'm wondering if you can start by telling us the story of your first encounter with this painting. Yeah, yeah, more than I'm more than happy to. Um... I feel very lucky that um, that this image is on the cover because it's um, it, it's an origin story for me um, in my relationship with Ito's work. I um, I'm in San Francisco right now and I've lived in the Bay Area for a long time, but I took um, a really funny one year long curatorial position at a place called the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago in 2015, and the assignment was to make a centennial exhibition. It's this extraordinary, small, non-collecting museum, and they've been around for 100 years, now 100 more than that. And um, I've been a huge fan 
and of that organization and, and learned a lot about a history of of post-war art mainly th through them and um, when they invited me to come out I, I jumped at the chance and um, I learned a lot about the history of the organization and um, Miyoko had the largest show of her lifetime in 1980 there just three years before she died in 19. 83. Um, so I knew her name from um, exploring the history of the institution, but I didn't know the work. I wasn't familiar with the work um, at all. And um, I have a great, um, a great friend and really great painter called Stuart Pittman, who lives here in the East Bay. And um, he encouraged me if I were moving to Chicago to, um, to connect with his father, who's an artist called John Pittman, whose work I didn't know at the time. And so um, I drove out to maybe it was an hour and a half west of Chicago to meet with John and do a studio visit um, with him. And I'd encourage you to check out his work. He's he's wonderful. And then um, we went back to um, to his house and he ordered us some pizza for dinner. And um, <laughs> before the pizza arrived, I um, I saw this painting. You know, I saw this very painting over his couch and um, was was totally stunned. And of course I had no, there are no title cards, you know, in people's homes, um, unless they're sociopaths. So I didn't know what it was. Um, and I was totally electrified um, by it. It seemed to have a relationship to lots of things that I was interested in or had seen. It seemed to overlap with a history of Chicago art that I was starting to learn more and more about. Um, but it was much more um, mysterious, um, approachable, um, but also opaque, um, geometric, but organic. It seemed to contain a lot of really compelling paradoxes that did sort of everything but repel a viewer. And so obviously I asked John what it was and he, um, not only did he, did he tell me that it was made by this artist Miyoko Ito in 1978, um, but he told me that he had acquired it that year from her gallery, Phyllis Kind, who John showed his work with at the time and that it had been, you know, the North star of his sort of artistic life since then. And, and he sort of communes with it. That was his word um, every morning. And so I felt a sort of immediate, you know, synergy, not just between the work, but through, but through John also. And I thought, well, if this is a guy who's lived with this painting for longer than I've been alive, then it probably has some, some serious um, magic going on. So, um, so I went back to the Renaissance Society on on Monday, and um, and I opened up her gray, you know, acid free archival box, and that's when I saw images of that show from 1980, and that's when I found the loan form from from John's collection. You know, he lent the painting to that show, and um, and it started me on on the path. Um, started me on the path. And then um, there are many, many steps between that and of course, making the book and, and making these related, these exhibitions um, before the book. But, um, you know, maybe just to skip ahead for a second, when it came time to decide what would go on the cover, um, me and, and the publisher, Matt Connors and um, Grant Schofield, great designer, Marnie Briggs, production manager, um, we, you know, there were a few contenders um, for images and it, you know, not only did proportionally this painting fit quite well, quite well in the dimensions that we'd articulated for the book, um, but we decided that maybe we could afford, you know, um, someone shopping at the bookstore, um, a, a similar, although maybe more diminutive experience um, than what I had um, in John's house that day. In other words, there's no text um, on the cover. So it, it seemed nice to really try to honor my own, um, you know, experience of the work. And despite the fact that initially I felt a little uncomfortable about leaving her name off of the cover because maybe it's it's her time or it's we should have her name in lights and we should um, in many ways. Um, ultimately, it just felt um, much richer and somehow more authentic to just show people, you know, the work because it's all about the work. Thank you for telling us that story. I, 
I love the story that comes out of your first encounter with this painting. And there were a couple of iterations of your collaboration with Miyoko Ito, both um, exhibitions that you organized in 2017 and 2018. Um, and I would love to hear a bit more about the process of first bringing those exhibitions together, especially the first one, which was in Berkeley, where she was, where she grew up partially um, between Berkeley and Japan. Um, and what that process was like initially bringing together a grouping of her artworks and beginning to be in conversation with her. Yeah, um, I was really excited and startled to discover that she was born and raised in Berkeley with a, a few years in Japan as a young, as a child. Um, and I knew that after Chicago, I would be returning to the Bay Area. So, um, so I thought, well, this is, we, we need to bring it, we need to bring it all, you know, back home um, and do a show in Berkeley. But there's, um, there's a problem that is also a challenge that is also an opportunity in, in um, showing Miyoko's paintings, which is that they're not, um, they're not in one place. In fact, they're in a million different places. <clears throat> there's no inventory, there's no, um, there's no attic, there's no basement, there's no high-end storage. There's just um, these paintings out in the world. She made a life as a painter, she made a career as a painter, and they're in a lot of museum collections, primarily in Chicago, but to a certain extent beyond, and they're in many um, private collections. So um, I was able to find fairly immediately a small handful of paintings because a certain number of museums have, you know, made their collections public um, on and visible online. But it was even even in 2015 and 2016, it was a lot less than it is now. And so um, I didn't really have enough paintings to make a, a show, but John Pittman connected me with a woman called Karen Lennox, who used to work for Phyllis Kind Gallery in Chicago, who had dealt these paintings in the 70s and so knew where they were. So, um, you know, spent an extraordinary day with Karen um, making appointments and visiting private um, collectors, some artists, some, um, you know, it, various tiers of collectors, I would say, some just very casual art lovers all the way to sort of, you know, museum donor kind of people. And um, everybody loved her work, you know, everybody seemed to have the feeling I did that this is someone who was really special um, and who maybe hadn't gotten her due more, more broadly or outside of Chicago. So I wrote to uh, my colleagues at the Berkeley Art Museum. It was Larry Rinder and Absara De Quincio who are no longer at that museum, but wonderful curators. And, and they were really enthusiastic about the project. And so they invited me to organize what they call a, a matrix exhibition, which is um, oftentimes it is an early show for, um, for an artist or a kind of rediscovery or something overlooked. And um, we did maybe 12 or 13 paintings and it was in their brand new building um, in Berkeley. And it was, it was gorgeous, you know, and it was a real occasion and the paintings are um, stunning. And I think had a, had a big effect on a lot of people. And then I heard from friends um, working at Artist Space in New York, Jamie Stevens and Jay Sanders, who invited me to take a version of that show to New York in 2018. And those are the images that are on the screen now. And you can see that it's it's not their kind of glorious, um, you know, well architected space that they're that they have now um, on Cortland Alley. It was right around the corner on White Street. And it's um the space was totally wonderful. And it was sort of like, I mean, I've you know, said this before, but it was sort of like the 70s, you know, New York. Um, exhibition loft show or something that she never that she never had so it felt really soulful and sweet and that's where uh, the artist and publisher Matt Connors first saw the work and um, you know excitingly it's where it's where a lot of people first saw the work um, I do want to say though that she had um, she had shown the work sorry in New York during her lifetime even she was in the 1975 Whitney Biennial and um, she's in the catalog for that show. And then there's a, a gallerist called Adam Baumgold who did shows in 2006 and 2014. So it's not like she was completely invisible. It's just a question of, um, you know, where and how one pays attention, I, I suppose. 
Yeah, we have a really great review of a show of hers at Adam Bomb Gold in 2006 by John Yao that I encourage audience members to read if you can. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful story. And I know from this artist space exhibition, this is sort of where your dialogue with Matt Connors began about whether or not there was the possibility of making a book. Um, and one of the things that Drew laughs at the artist space book launch was you talking about, you know, that initial encounter and, and your uh, original thinking that, you know, maybe that was something a museum could do. Um, you know, that that an institution could take that on and do a show that cataloged all of her work. But eventually you do it and um, you sign on and the two of you work together on this project for many years, finding her work. And I'm curious if you can talk, obviously, a bit about how these exhibitions morphed into that, but also about what working with Matt and Pre-Echo gave you as a um, you were bringing the publication together that you may not have had in an institutional setting um, and that you were able to take on in terms of the breadth of the publication that we see and experience now. Yeah, great, good question. Um, Matt is, um, in addition to being um, a really, really terrific um, artist, runs a, a publishing house called Pre-Echo and has made a series of really beautiful um, sort of artist-driven books um mainly in, in small runs you know he, he he's a painter and he does the publishing you know sort of on the side and um like i said he just sort of he fell in love with this work and he he reached out to me um in the pandemic about another project that i'd done um a book that i'd written about um bay area art, sort of a constellation of bay area artists with jay an artist called jay defeo at its center and he said really nice things about that book and then you know, he sort of, he, he said, well, who, who's going to do this Ito book? And I guess what, what Chloe is referring to is the fact that, you know, I was, um, I thought, well, a museum's got to do it because it's, it's a very heavy lift um, because you have to find all the work and pay to have the work photographed. And then it, it's just um, kind of soup to nuts kind of a, a project. And we just got ourselves more and more excited about doing it together and because Matt is an artist and because he had a relationship with Grant who's a beautiful designer um, and because we had sort of in-house production manager who also works with Matt in his studio Marnie um, it seemed like just enough um, just enough sort of stakeholder immediate stakeholders um, and players to make the thing work and so you know artist driven I run a space in San Francisco called Cushion Works, and I'm not an artist, but I think of it as an as an artist run space sort of in the spirit of um, of an artist run space because artists can get away with a lot, um, and artists don't work by committee, and artists um, our agenda was to make you know the most beautiful book possible for this really stunning artist, and that that was kind of it. Um, and we thought that um, if we're in love with the stuff, then other people must be in love with it too. That that was, it wasn't, you know, overburdened um, by extraneous um, concerns. It certainly wasn't overburdened by extraneous meetings and, and things like that. There's sort of no bureaucracy, which really helps if you're trying to do something like this. So we sort of streamlined as much as possible the process of what it would do, a beta, um, to sort of do this. And um, we thought it was important to us though, to leave room for a museum, who knows what museum, um, to take on a big Ito project, you know, in, in real time space, in, in, in not that a book isn't real time in space, but in the space of a gallery and um, afford folks the chance to really commune with these paintings in person. So we didn't want to make um, the retrospectival catalog that a museum should or hopefully does take on. So toward that effort, you know, the only writing in the book is um, is a long essay that I wrote that's largely but not exclusively biographical that traces her life and where she goes and who she's spending time with and then the development of her practice um, and an interview with her from the late 1970s that was um, performed by the video databank. So there's lots and lots of room for interpretation and for scholarship and of course for the presentation of the paintings but we sort of wanted to make it as lean and mean as possible which I realize is somewhat ironic because the thing weighs 46 pounds which is 
only a modest exaggeration. Um, it's it's a big book, and we wanted to um, afford viewers um, an encounter on every page with with the painting. So, for those of you who haven't seen the book, there's an image on the right side when you open the book up, and on the left hand side, it's uh, it's blank. There, at the very bottom, there's just some text that tells you what the painting is. So, it's sort of a it's a it's a new painting. It's a new beginning um, with each turn of the page, which was a um, a big idea in Miyoko's life that each beginning, each painting is is a new beginning. In fact, a, a new beginning of painting itself, you know, every time, which is, this is a really beautiful idea. Yeah, this is a good moment for me to lift up the book so that everyone can see it in, in three-dimensional space. Um, yeah, I, I noted the poetry of you and Matt going into uh, these private, homes and domestic spaces and um in an effort to catalog her work kind of moving things around getting on the couch moving the moving the living room I imagined you both like moving through these dining room spaces um and sort of the kinship that has with Miyoko's practice itself and you know she often alluded to furnishings or to cabinetry in her work itself um, and alluded to um, the fact that for well, she quote you quote her in the book and in her interview saying, uh, "Furniture never stays furniture." Furniture became this access point for her to think about um, the psychological and the emotional and the relationship to herself and to home. Um, and so, I'd love to hear you speak a bit about what we're looking at, which are the photographs of you. Um, encountering her collectors, many of whom were artists, uh, were in our artists, um, who are admirers of hers. Um, and if you can share some of the stories of, of that experience, but also of finding these, these works in situ. Yeah. yeah, it was, um, it was a real, it was a real treat. And I should, I, I guess I should just back up a second by saying that by, by freak circumstance, um, me and and my partner and artist Lindsay White um, moved to Chicago um, when I was already hard at work on the book because she got a, a teaching position there. We've since moved back to the Bay, which is sort of another story. But um, but we moved to Chicago, and so it afforded me the opportunity to. Um, it just it was perfect, uh, you know, kismet. It was this really strange echo of my experience at the Renaissance Society to go back sort of on assignment. Um, a different sort of assignment, more specific assignment. So I, um, I just let it be known, you know, when I was there, um, that I was, I was on the lookout for these things and, um, spent my days largely, you know, either, um, researching and, and writing this essay, um, or taking a field trip with a, with our amazing photographer, a guy called Jim Prince in Chicago to visit, these people and learn about the work and learn about their lives and learn about how they live with this work, sometimes in completely unbelievable circumstances. Um, like in this photograph, this collector had five paintings and two drawings. And um, I had borrowed two of these for the show at Berkeley and uh, an artist space. And yeah, the furniture, I love that quote. Right, that furniture never stays furniture. Um, I mean, if you look at this painting on the left and you look straight down to the chair, you 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 automatically see some sort of relationship there between how life looks and how life is represented um, on the on the cloth. So um, it inspired me to think more about Ito as someone who really paid attention and who was always looking and always studying. And it added a, a kind of still life register to the paintings that I always suspected was there. But um, what can I say, sort of increase the prismatic dimensionality of the viewing of the paintings because they always felt psychological. They always felt um, landscape inspired. And now with you know the influence of furniture that she talks about um, beginning to form when she does a series of repeated visits to an artist colony, a place called McDowell. Um, she says there was kind of 
furniture lying around all over the place and she would set it up as a, as a tableau and she would use that as a foundation to build paintings. This is in the seventies. And, um, um, it, uh, what can I say? It inspired me to pay attention more. And it also, I think there's always a turning in her work in the stages of her development. Things be, sort of flow into and out of what might be called the perceivable world. Um, speaking of a perceivable world, the back, this photograph that Chloe's just um, just put here on the screen is, um, is the only work we found in, in somebody's bathroom. So people live with art, of course, in all kinds of, of ways. And I think that that was, I think that that's really critically important um, because most people see it in, in museums, but of course um, um, it, it, it manifests um, in, in predictable and unpredictable ways. And it only sort of plays up this notion of, of the domestic or looking at, at how space is configured um, architecturally in, in one's life. And, you, and here's a curious detail in this bathroom. There's this funny piece of stained glass below it um, that was surprising. Yeah, and did, did these interior spaces highlight elements of the paintings that you might not have otherwise paid attention to had they been in a white cube space? I know in a previous conversation between us, you talked about the light from a window, maybe shedding some insight into her pre-drawing process or her, her right. underpainting for you. And I'm curious about that as well before we move on, just, just sort of the act of moving these things around and getting yeah. familiar with them and familiar with her. Yeah. So th this is a photograph. I'm visiting um, somebody who had had a few um ito paintings and i i mean despite the fact that it's somewhat embarrassed embarrassing to share this image um um it may be important or instructive even in letting folks know that um wow we didn't set out to do um art history we set out to do documentation um and it became art history along the way so and to to do art history and certainly to do this book you um you know i guess you have to you have to take your shoes off um and maybe sometimes you don't have gloves and you're as careful as you can possibly um be with someone who um has lived with the painting or sometimes more than one painting for 40 years and who seems to take it off the wall or pick it up quite quite willy-nilly um, there's a really significant divide between how people live with work and how a museum lives with and conserves um, conserves work. So um, it, there's also, I think, there's somewhat of an occupational hazard when you're really studying um, not just painting, but any artist and trying to learn more about who maybe an artist was who is um, is not around anymore. And so um, there, sometimes I would see, you know, an arched window that would look just like a, a form in the painting and think, oh, you know, she must have known about this window. She must have stood right here and you sort of get carried away by thinking if she saw it. It must be in the work. And I think that that's um, that is con sort of conjecture at best. All I can say is that it made the experience richer for me because I became a better looker. Yeah, and you can see here, this is you sort of starting to map out the chronology of all the works after they had been photographed. Yeah, so this is, um, once we had, the, the projects really snowballed and um, we found many more paintings um, than we had anticipated. We had thought maybe, you know, the process gets cooking for her around the mid to late 60s and we, if we were lucky, would collect maybe 60, 70 paintings and, um, and we would make a focused catalog, but as we found more and more, um, a couple of things became clear. One is that um, we could track and trace the development of her practice in a way that had never been done before because nobody had seen this work. So, I mean, in higher resolution, you can see, and if you flip through the book, the way the paintings start large and they're dark and then they get lighter and then they get warmer and then they get really geometrically complex and then they become stage-like and then they get real hot and then she dies. So um, we were able to do that work. And we also 
like getting back to the art history thing, we had to perform art history. So there were a number of paintings that came to us um, undated and sometimes in some cases untitled. And we were able through sort of cross-referencing checklists and loan forms from decades past, we're able to name paintings that we thought, you know, didn't have titles. So um, this was a very, very special day when Matt came to California. Um, the, like I said, the space I run is called Cushion Works and it's in an active cushion making factory. And on the third floor that, you know, is not mine, it is part of the cushion factory. They have this really beautiful, impossibly long table and they use to cut fabric. And so we laid everything out and then we, we had to take out a ladder. So this is a photograph that I made from a ladder. And, um, you know, it still gives me chills to look at um, just like how much, how exciting it was. And also like how much effort <laughs> went, in, went into doing this thing, you know, like it shouldn't be this hard to be able to experience um, works that are so undeniably special um, and, and beautiful. But I think at this point we realized that we were, you know, we were um, well on, well on our way. It's one of the gifts of the book to be able to page through a chronology of her work and to be able to see a train of thought through time. Um, and in, it's really notable when you're when you're paging through the pages. Um, and there are just so many interesting points of what she would call departure in the work where the work deviates from where it's been and, and moves into a new chapter. Um, and we'll get to that. But one of the things that surprised me most about that chronology, especially because the essay at the start of the book is is mostly going into her biography, is that she began as a watercolorist, um, mainly because I think of watercolor as having this pace to it and uh, being quite, quite quick and um, being and, and I, when I think of Miyoko Ito, I think about the slowness of her later paintings and working day by day on a painting that might take up to a month to complete. Um, and I'm curious, as you were looking at her early watercolors, which I think we have one on the left side of the page here um, from 1941, um, she studied watercolor at, at Berkeley. Um, and what, what do you think exists as a trace or as a beginning for her as an artist in this early watercolor practice? Yeah, it's it's funny to read her accounts of studying um, in the art department at Berkeley because there was there was only watercolor. Uh, you that's just what was taught, and that's what you did. And the style of the day was something called synthetic cubism, which is a term you don't hear very often uh, these days. And this example on the left would have been her making a plain air watercolor in this sort of fractured picture plane of discernible architectures. But it's curious. I mean, if you look high and you look low, you see a, a whiff of atmosphere. You know, like she she is interested in a kind of abstraction, even as a very young person. And so I think if we think about Ito as someone who's looking and who's studying and is trying to understand her place, in an overwhelming world, which it is, um, that remains consistent, even though the forms, the shapes, the objects sort of slowly um, blow apart and move toward um, an increasing level of abstraction. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I noted throughout her biography is this undulation between being an outsider, um, you know, both. Uh, so she was studying at Berkeley and then um, during World War II, she's interned at Tan Faran. Um, and at Tan Faran, she is part of an artist community and an artist school um, at the internment camp. Um, she learns that she graduated with the highest honors from Berkeley, and then she goes to Smith College, is able to leave Tanferan to study at Smith, um, which obviously probably presented itself to her as an entirely new environment and new coast and new community then as well. Um, and then from Smith, she goes to Chicago to the School of the Art Institute, 
each time sort of cultivating a community of inspiration and mentorship in each in each space. And so she kind of carries these um, these labels of both being an outsider, but also being the artist's artist. Um, and they always sort of coincide together. And I'm curious if you can speak a bit about her experiences moving around and how that played out in the work itself and in her development as an artist. Really good question. And there's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting when you're trying to to understand or illuminate an artist's life and work because there's just so much you don't know. And so occasionally it's difficult to define the line between scholarship and close looking and, um, you know, conjectural lift off or something. And that was something that I was keenly aware of and sort of really didn't want to screw up. So, what we know is that when she was about five years old, she moved from Berkeley to Japan um, with her mother and her sister. And she describes her Japanese experience as um, totally formative. And it seems to be a little bit split between formative and a traumatic way. And she describes herself as falling very, very ill. I mean, she says she couldn't walk. She understands it later as a childhood nervous breakdown, which obviously sounds uh, totally brutal. At the same time, she's studying uh, calligraphy in school. She says that as early as, you know, the equivalent of first grade, she's out making plein air drawings in space with her, with her teachers. Um, she says athletics was a big deal too, but she didn't really excel in that department. Um, so she, and she also talks about Japan as being, um, it, it, it's just, it, she comes back to Berkeley and she's still a young person, but it's so fascinating to think that she moved there before she could really talk. And so she could only speak Japanese when she comes back to the United States. So in trying to situate her as a kind of artist, artist, outsider, insider, insider, outsider of what, you think about her being born and raised in one place, moving to another, acquiring language, moving back, needing to learn a different language. And it it, it may help you um, understand um, her relationship to herself and her surroundings. And the fact that she's pulled out of Cal her senior year and placed in this internment camp, I mean, it was it was a series of months that she was there, although it no doubt had a, a an effect on her consciousness. How could it not? She lived in a horse stall with her family, um, along with thousands of other Japanese Americans at um, at a camp that impossibly is, you know, just a handful of miles south from where I am now in San Francisco. And um, and I do think that the paintings, once they sort of hit their, what you might understand is their mature phase, really oscillate between a feeling of confinement um, and expanse. And I think that that is really fundamental in understanding what she's up to. And um, you also mentioned the the, the drawings, you know, um, the the paintings, um, the paintings all begin as as drawings. So you think about her as a college student going out into the fields, rendering this immediate surrounding. And you think of her many decades later, approaching a canvas as she would a blank sheet of paper. In other words, with a pencil, you know, with a charcoal. And the line work is um, is the basis of all this stuff. And she said that that was, that was the hard work. I mean, you have to find the painting in the drawing. She didn't know what colors would emerge once she'd already shaped out the contours of the painting and she would also apply a kind of a underpainting in reds and greens. It's hard to tell over a computer screen, of course, but in person, and I hope you all have the experience to see these one day, um, they're really, not only are they textured, but they're, they have a, um, they have a certain depth to them. They're layered. So you can see that she's applied one color, then another color, maybe then another color scratched at it, um, built on top of it. And so there's a presence of, uh, there's that feeling, I guess, of, of, um, 
of layeredness that hits, at least to me, on a sort of emotional level, you know, that these paintings build on experience, that something has been here before, and they're very, very psychological in that way. And they they carry, I think, traces of of her places, um, you know, with her from, from Cal to, to Japan, to Tanferan, um, to Massachusetts at Smith, and then ultimately where Chicago, where she, she really became the artist that, that she that she was. Yeah, and and what about Chicago? I mean, w uh, the book talks a lot about the community she cultivated in Chicago of other artists. She studied at the Art Institute of Chicago at the time that Kathleen Blackshear was teaching there. And while she didn't study with Blackshear, um, she was peers with a lot of the artists who did. Um, and Blackshear was certainly an influence on her. Um, and she was friends with many of the Chicago imagists um, and, and showed with Phyllis Kind. Um, what do you think Chicago as a city and as a social space at that time provided for her? Yeah, that's a that's another good question. And it, it's a little it's funny because I've lived in the Bay Area for, for a long time. The, the only other place I've lived for an extended period of time in, in the last decade or two is Chicago for these year long stints. And I found um, whereas, of course, it's different than the Bay Area in a lot of ways with relationship to to art or the what we understand as the art world, there are there are similarities. It, it's not um, it's it's not a center. I mean, it's just, it's not an, there's a lot going on, but there is a ceiling in terms of critical, curatorial, or commercial, you know, success. Um, of course, we know, and our artists need to know, if they don't know that success, you know, has a very tenuous relationship with quality, you know, tenuous, uh, remarkably tenuous, um, the work, something that I have to keep in mind is that this work that she made um, didn't get better as a result of being shown in Chelsea. It just got more visible. I think that that's important. And I think that in Chicago, she was able to, um, you know, really blaze her own trail. I mean, she had friends, the respect um, and admiration of her friends and fellow artists was totally and critically important to her. She was able to instigate a number of sort of self-directed sort of DIY exhibition spaces um, and projects. It's um, then more than now, maybe like the last great semi-affordable American city. She could live her life and she could be an artist and she could have a community. She could do what she had to do. And she was maybe half a generation older than um, these images artists that you mentioned who went on to really make a name, not only for Phyllis Kind, their dealer, but of course for, for themselves and the Harry Who and various groups sort of insubstantiations that they formed to show their work. And she sits up a little bit apart from all that. And in fact, she, she inspired Jim Nutt and Gladys Nielsen and a number of the other images artists to sign on to Phyllis Kind's roster. Miyoko was the first living artist that Phyllis ever showed. She was in a different business before that. She showed older paintings. So, um, so I see her sort of just ahead of the pack. And I see Chicago as a place that is really open to experimentation because, um, because I don't, and I also don't want to sound um, cynical or or jaded because obviously I live in San Francisco and I really value being here and I value so many of the artists here and I um, artists who choose to go their own way is um, for me is what it's all about and I find that in the absence of sort of overwhelming you know, success, there's more of a likelihood that artists will lead themselves to unpredictable places, not as a rule, of course, but, um, and I think Chicago offered that. I want to talk a little bit about some of the elements of her, of her work. Um, and maybe a good segue to this is I was reading an anecdote about Miyoko Ito 
in Chicago, um, one of her friends said she used to wear her socks inside out because she liked the way the seams looked. Um, and I really think that that's emblematic of her paintings and the way that her line allows for um, an unthreaded seam. Um, and this way for you to see where the painting could go beyond where it is right in front of you. Um, and so I've pulled together these three images, which are of works at the beginning of the 1960s where she really starts to find the gradient uh, that that she ends up working with for a long time. What do you think the gradient yeah. unlocked for her um, in terms of just it, in terms of meditating on on a horizon, but also in terms of allowing for an ambiguity that renders the paintings so beautifully like it just allows for so much more exploration of dimension um as well as um obviously alluding to a landscape i'd love to hear you speak on it though i'm sure you have many thoughts looking at all of these i mean you <clears throat> you just did a lot of good work um so i i salute you for that and also for putting these images together it's really nice to see these three like this you know i've never I've never seen that. I think that the gradient affords uh, atmosphere. And I think that if you think about the gradient, <clears throat> you know, a color fade as, um, you know, you think about somebody maybe thinking in terms of black and white and all the metaphorical implications of that. And then you think in terms of someone beginning to understand, accept and grapple with the spaces in between black and white and and i think that's that's what it's about and i think that this is the case for a number of abstractionists um around this time that you know furniture at at some point in their development furniture is furniture and then it's not and then what is it and i don't know what it is and i'm not certain in a way she knew but because it was always changing it can also never be known. And I think that that's what the gradient um, is about. It's a literal backdrop to hold ambiguities. And I, when I was in Chicago recently, just last month for a really terrific book event we did at the Renaissance Society to celebrate the launch, I was staying at a hotel downtown. <clears throat> and, um, and you know, I was I was going back to my room in the evening and looking between buildings and there was a it was not a California kind of light, you know, and it went from from brown to blue. And I thought, well, gee, you know, my God, that's again, could, could just be me seeing things. But, you know, she did live there and she did go downtown. And she did have friends and she was around. She was engaged to a certain extent in civic life. And I thought, well, this is what she's looking at. This is what she's seeing. And it makes good sense as the backdrop to uh, to all this work. I also feel like the gradient sees a uh, delineation between her underpainting process and the process of overpainting that increasingly gets perfected with time where the gradient keeps her strokes horizontal and kind of gets her into that blank mind mentality that she's seeking in working on these works. Um, and when I imagine her making these, I imagine sort of that beginning phase of building, like the, the building the composition, thinking about where the forms go and sort of the layering down on within charcoal and in paint and and erasing and, and then covering over traces and working away, chipping away at something. But then this act of painting being this very fluid, almost breath-like, meditation-like process that's slow and tender and that allows for these revelations throughout uh, where she lets lines stay put, um, lets things remain unbuttoned um, opens drawers. Um, and so she's often in conversation with herself almost, um, you know, starting with something and then allowing herself to reveal with what she started from. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that too, because 
I feel like the gradient allowed for a technical process that also increasingly imbues itself into the practice and into the work and into the repetition of some of these series. Yeah, she wasn't, um, it's totally beautiful. Thanks for that. I, um, she was, she, um, she was interested in surrealism, but she was interested in many other things, but I think that she was inspired by the technical proficiency of the surrealists. Um, the lines are tight. Um, you know, the fades are right on, um, the details are sharp. And I think that, um, that she needed to, in her own way, needed to make, um, kind of a soft backdrop for that sort of, that sort of proficiency, that sort of like um, technical accomplishment. And it's right, you can't tell, um, you can't tell really online, but each and every stroke here is, is horizontally applied. So, you know, you begin to think about the practice as a kind of wiping away um, and seeing anew, or at least that's sort of how I think about it. And also it makes it much more of um, a ritualized um, or repetitive um, kind of process. So the works appear, they hold light differently, whether you're looking down on them or up at them or to the side on them. And, and she worked with natural light <clears throat> in her studio in Chicago. And she talks about how, you know, she can walk in and see a painting in the afternoon. It's a totally different painting. And so um, I think that she was really keenly aware of how um, how our approach to the work and whatever sort of technical approach to the work would affect how it was seen. I mean, I think that that's in some ways a very inadequate response to your, you know, your, your thoughts. But, um, but I do think that it's, um, that, that there is something, there, there is something undiscovered about the horizontality and the repetitive motions of it that, that is still, um, um, un unknowable to me. I want to pause here because when I think about her process itself, this to me feels like a portrait of her process as a painter, um, sort of a way of building a structure from that layering and from um, what arrives, the figure with a life of its own that sort of arrives from revisiting and layering and repeating over something over and over again. Of course, when first seeing this work, I thought about, you know, stacks of paper on the desk and and books piling up and um, just the weight of, of various things um, in domestic life, kind of finding their way onto shelving or onto uh, studio spaces. But it also takes the shape of a form. It looks like a person sort of shrugging their shoulders or um, there's just so many ways to look at this one work. And one of the things that I think it brings out too is she, there's this part of her interview in 1978 where she talks about Sarah Canwright. Um, and she talks about uh, Sarah had a show at Phyllis Kind and, and, and she was really impressed with Sarah's paintings. And she asked Sarah, how she got to this simple way of using color. And Sarah is like, honestly, I don't know. And Miyoko was really enamored by that unknowing, you know, yeah. just the, the feeling of not knowing and, and the simplicity. Mm -hmm. And I think this painting perfectly encapsulates um, how she begins to really hone down her colors and um, focus on very particular color choices as a way of achieving um, an effect and a sense of striving in the paintings. And I'm curious yeah. if you if you think there are other influences as well beyond Sarah. Yeah, I mean that makes me think of so many things. But um, um, chiefly, it makes me think of um, you know the great artist Popel, another great Chicago artist who you know tragically recently died and you know this great thing that he says that you know as an artist um knowing what you're doing is greatly overrated and i think about that all the time and i think that that sentiment is a little bit lost in the discourse um right now um in the art world is as as we know it and i think that she was um very loyal to her own intuition 
And um, she also said things like content is pointed out to me by other people. She did what she did. She's influenced as we all are in innumerable and unknowable ways. And it manifested unpredictably, despite the fact that the paintings all have a sort of cousin to cousin relationship with each other. So I think that that was, um, and that, that experience she had in Sarah, with Sarah, I think was really freeing to her. And I do think to a certain extent that art is um, art is a kind of permission, you know? And I think that artists are very hungry for permission because the structures of art don't necessarily advertise that are they afford that sort of permission. And in many ways it's, it's the opposite. So the fact that an artist would say, hey, I'm just out here sort of figuring it out as I go along would be totally liberatory, you know, to someone like, to someone like Ito. And it, I think that it allowed her to feel more confident in establishing what became a totally idiosyncratic language. And I think one of the reasons why the paintings were less visible than they are now is because they're very hard to classify. They don't fit into one unique category. And of course, that's what art history wants to do. That's what any history wants to do. So the fact that they're, they resemble objects in real time and space, but they're abstract, but they're surrealistic, but you could even make an argument that they're a little poppy, that they're cubist, that they're fractured, that they're mirrored. It's like, what do you do with it? So when someone said to her, oh, me, you know, Mio, her nickname was Mio, um, your paintings are abstract impressionism. She thought, well, that sounds about right. I mean, she was kind of game for however anybody wanted to think or talk about the work. So, you know, I imagine her being just as inspired by the toaster on her counter as the lake, as the atmosphere between the Chicago buildings. And I think that, um, you know, it wasn't surprising, I'll say, to learn that, um, you know, not only did she make a lot of her own clothes, but sometimes she wore them inside out. I mean, this is somebody who, who is... Um, um, wants to make her seem as visible. You know, John Yao gave me that idea. This is someone who's very hungry to make her seems visible, but at the same time, you know, coherent, you know? Um, and I think she did it time and time again. I mean, one of the very strange things about this project is that there's not a sleeper painting in the bunch. I mean, that is really, really uncommon um, in doing this sort of work. So we didn't edit anything out. Um, of this book. Um, and she made between, I don't know, maybe six to 10 paintings a year is what she says. Um, so there are, you know, there's a finite number of works, um, but, but they hardly, you know, all have to be good than they are. Yeah. I mean, I could talk to you about the painting, the paintings themselves for many more hours, but I think for the sake of the questions that we're, we're piling up from the audience, I'll, I'll ask you one more, um, yeah. which is um, a lot of your, since that first encounter of the painting over the couch, um, this project has really been a call and response of, you know, making an exhibition, making another exhibition, and then seeing interest sort of come back to you and to her and to the work and then, and then working on this book. Um, and I imagine that this book has just led to an enormous <laughs> response, um, just in terms of both the paintings themselves being visible at the scale um, and able to be turned through page by page in this new way. But also the book literally calls out to the audience with these slides at the end um, of paintings that you know exist, but you haven't found. Right. Um, and sort of asks for its story to be continued um, in it, in its conclusion. And so I'm curious if you can tell us a bit about the reception of the book since it was published at the end of last year, as well as um, anything you've discovered since it was published. Yeah. Um, um, you know, when we closed the the show at Artist Space in 2018, I mean, I literally, you know, I remember the, like turning out the lights at the end of the night. I thought maybe I maybe I had done my my duty, you know, maybe I had done my my job with regards to Ito's work. I didn't um, anticipate 
um, spending, you know, all this time doing it. Of course, I'm thrilled that I did. But similarly, I thought when we, you know, when we wrapped the book that, 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 you know, that was that, but, um, there's a funny thing about this, this kind of thing that, you know, that people call legacy um, work that I didn't anticipate I was doing. Um, like, you know, maybe, maybe it never ends. Um, there are these paintings, like, like Chloe said, um, these are scans of slides that we were given, you know, a few people came out of the woodwork and said, um, you know, we have slides from the Phyllis Kind gallery. And so this is a gallery that would be documenting paintings. And we know that the colors most likely have faded in some cases dramatically from their technology in the 60s and 70s. So we didn't want to blow them up and sort of advertise them full screen in the book, full page. Um, but we did want to establish um, not only the feeling that, well, you know, there are more of these out there and they're just as great, but also, you know, if you, um, you know, call the hotline if you've seen any of these things. So um, since publication, a few people have reached out and um, we found, I can't remember, I don't know, maybe six, seven of these paintings, um, maybe eight of them and a couple that are not even in the slide collection. So um, it has me at least thinking more broadly about what it means to look after somebody's memory, to steward their legacy. Um, it clearly has me intrigued with the proposition of, of a retrospective of experiencing a lot of this work um, in person. And I think that, um, you know, most of all, I think that it's, uh, I've been really buoyed by a sense of goodwill, or, I guess, around this project. Um, and I think to a certain extent, maybe every artist is an outsider artist, you know, like not every artist works alone, but on some level, every artist is alone. And I think when you do this kind of work, maybe sometimes you feel like you're alone too, because it's odd to be spending your days doing this kind of stuff. Um, and the fact that there's so much um, energy around the project and the book and, um, you know, that we sold out the first printing and we've just done a second one it's um you know to feel like like i'm not alone that she's not alone that there are other people who who experience a kind of gravitas around this work her work um is just you know um totally exciting well i think that is a perfect place for us to stop our conversation and open it up to audience questions but i just want to give you all my thanks for this dialogue today, Jordan. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thanks to you, Chloe. Thanks for the, such great questions and observations. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Chloe, for the incredible questions and Jordan for the really special insights. This has been a really just joy, um, such a wonderful conversation between the two of you and amazing visuals too. Really nice slideshow. Um, really, really grateful for this. We do have some questions from the audience today. Um, and our first question will come from our friend GE. GE, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank, thank you. Wasn't, wasn't expecting. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Jordan. Um, you kind of touched a little bit about this with the Chicago talk a little bit, but Ito once said in, in an interview somewhere that I saw oh gosh, long, long time ago, um, that Chicago gave her a sense of surrealism. What do you think uh, is about the city that gave her that sense? I know you talked about the light and and, 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 and seeing the light between buildings and things, but, but uh, there are other things too? There was surrealist work shown there and there were surrealist practitioners like Gertrude Abercrombie. And there was a sense of freedom, I think, um, of expression. And so... Um, there were a few galleries that showed surrealist work. I mean, I don't necessarily think that Chicago has a surrealist affect about it, but I think in in sort of cruising the halls of the Art Institute of Chicago, let alone some private galleries, there would be um, amazing examples of surrealist experiments because that, that museum in particular is collected broadly um, in that area. So I think that she was, you know, just as inspired by 
<clears throat> the Bonard paintings that she encountered and his delineation of space as she would be by, you know, what someone like Gertrude Abercrombie, you know, had done just a couple of decades before. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, GE. Um, and thank you, Jordan. Um, our next question is from Sid. Um, Sid, I will give you the chance to unmute. Um, if Sid isn't there, we can, I can read it on their behalf. Um, Sid wrote, did you happen to see any William Schwendler, a friend of Ito's, paintings in the homes of collectors of Chicago, one of the most abstract imagists? Um, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know the name and um, send me an email. <laughs> but no, I don't know it. I didn't see. I don't think I saw it. Sorry, Schwelder. Schwedler. Hard <laughs> 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 this one. <laughs> Um, but cool. Thank you, Sid. Um, our next question is from uh, Lily, and I will read on Lily's behalf. Um, Lily wrote, first, I want to thank Jordan for his and his collaborators for the amazing, incredible book. I'm curious if anything is known about Ito's practice of sometimes leaving the nails on the tacking edge of her canvases out a little. Or does Jordan have any thoughts on why she may have done this? Yes. Um, yeah. So as you could probably see from the images that Chloe shared on a number of paintings, there's this sort of halo of half-driven tacks around the paintings. Um, and it, they're unlike anything else. And they're, they're pretty intense and clearly appear to be nothing but intentional. Um, uh, Curiously, um, as Karen Lennox has told me, you know, in her direct experience and the experience of certain others who, who worked with Ito um, around, you know, sort of moving the work around or framing the work, showing the work that, um, that she was, she wasn't, um, she wasn't too attached to this structure that she had initiated. She, you know, she said, oh, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Just kind of pound the tax in if you want to frame it. Um, and Karen tells a story about them moving. They had just created a storage system at Phyllis Kind and they'd carpeted the, this, the bottom of this area. And so moving the tax around was a colossal pain in the butt. And so she said, you know, Mio, what's like, what's the story with this stuff? And and same deal. Miyoko said, you know, don't worry about it. Just kind of pound them in. I don't, I don't want to give you a headache. Now, of course, this is an artist who's on the record saying the content is pointed out to her by other people. So... Um, I think there is room to be thoughtful um, and sensitive about what that might mean um, for us, really, because we can never know what it will mean for her. And John Yao has written on this and has suggested that um, um, if you're someone who's maybe been ripped out of your home and forced to move somewhere else, that you would keep the tax exposed because it would it would facilitate the painting's removal. So you could take the tax out, roll the painting up and take it with you. Um, I think that that's a, a sort of compelling read on it. And I also think that there's um, there's an account uh, by an, uh, another amazing artist called Mine Okubo, um, who spent time at Tanferan, who's also a Calif young California Berkeley student um, who wrote a graphic novel. Um, about her experience at Tanferan, and it, it's incredible. And um, there's an illustration of her moving into the uh, horse stalls, and she she recounts how they performed a once-over. Uh, they sort of painted everything white, but there's still dust and horse hair and stuff all over the place. But there are um, half-driven um, nails all over the wall to to attach horse-related uh, you know tools and stuff. Too. So it's 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 kind of not for me to say, but I was struck by by the resonance um, by the resonance there, and and I feel um, to a certain extent comfortable sharing that because of the um, the psychological nature of the paintings, and also it shouldn't maybe it, it didn't come as that much of a surprise to me to to learn in trying to find literally find 
a number of the the lenders um, to her exhibitions in the 70s and 80s, um, many of whom have died just in recent years, um, that many of them were psychiatrists, you know, and psychologists in the Chicago area. Um, so, you know, I think I think it's open to interpretation. That was an amazing answer. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, and thank you, Lily, for the question. Um, we've got two more questions, if that's all right, Jordan. Um, our next question is from Donald, and if you'd like to unmute, you can. Um, hi. Hi. Um, hi, uh, is, this is Donald. Uh, my question is, I really love the artwork and the book, and I've never seen her work in person. Um, my, my curiosity is, it seems suddenly there is a big number of viewers that like her work so much more than back in the 60s and the 70s. Um, are we more ready for her work today than in the past? Have the viewers, like our education, our background has changed to make us more able to appreciate her work now than before? That's <laughs> such a good question. Donald, I mean, the work hasn't changed. You know, that's the amazing thing. So what has? Um, have we changed? Has culture and society changed? Has the art market changed? Has museum culture changed? Um, ha I think that there are a variety of reasons why the work wasn't taken up in her, more, more broadly, let's say, in her lifetime. And I think um, one is racism. I mean, she's a Japanese American woman working in Chicago. She she wouldn't have really fit in with the imagist gang. She wouldn't. She didn't really fit in with any gang. She, um, she didn't really have a clique or a crew. And I think that that can live at exposure. Um, I also think the work was you know pretty pretty radical, pretty radical for its time, and maybe hard to see um, on its own terms. And then. Um, Another reason is is regionalism. You know, artists who are not in major art centers are often, you know, written off or understood as regional, which is um, really weird and problematic because it assumes that a place like New York is not a region. Um, so um, there are certain styles and subjects and themes that emerge all over the place um, at any given time, and I think that. Um, you know, the fact that Phyllis Kind went from opening a gallery in New York, uh, sorry, in Chicago to, to New York, she opened a gallery in New York at some point to try to really raise the flag for these Chicago artists. But because the gallery, maybe because, maybe because is not the right word, but the strategy was to show a lot of Chicago artists in New York. And I think maybe that, um, maybe that didn't help in a certain way that didn't help it was sort of the Chicago gallery. And I think that there's, um, there's a there there may have been a sort of hindrance to that. So I, I think that that's that there's sort of a constellation um, of reasons. I, I like to think that people would have been just as ready in 1976 um, a, as we are now. But I also think that there are certain ideas at play in the work that sort of went 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 quiet or went quieter for a number of years. And um, the truth is, I'm both like very. Um, not to sound dorky, but like uh, part of me is not surprised by the response. I like I know how good the work is, and so I'm um, I'm like this. That's right. This this is how it should be. But at the same time, um, you know, if if you look around right now at um, at sort of what's what's trending, maybe it, it's not really like um, psychologically intuitive painters from the Midwest, you know. Like th this is this is left of center kind of stuff, and it makes me think, at least, that maybe um, lots of us are hungry for um, more mysterious and um, and unknowable um, kinds of statements by artists that um, that we may have ignored. Great. great, thank you. Thank you, Donald. That was such a great question, and Jordan, that was a really incredible answer. Thank you so much. Um, we've got one final audience question for you today, and it's from Richard. Richard, you should be able to unmute and ask. Hi, thank you so much. <clears throat> I was, when I first saw her work at Matthew Marks, um, I was just knocked out by the quality, the crafts, the poetry between the works. Um, and I immediately 
just had this feeling of the Southwest. Her mm. her um, palette is so um, beautiful in terms of earth tones. So to hear that she mostly lived in cities kind of surprises me. Did she um, spend any time in the desert or, um, you know, was, was there any, did you learn anything specific about um, how she arrived at her palette? Um, she was an inveterate traveler. You know, we know that. I, I don't think she spent significant time outside of Chicago, but we found postcards that she sent from, you know, from Mexico and Cairo and, and all kinds of places. And I think when she was, when she was in motion and she was away from home, she was paying, you know, just as much, if not far more attention to what she was looking at. Um, she was also kind of a collector of of trinkets and artifacts from, from her travels. So uh, there are some photographs we found of her house that's filled with baskets and figurines and, and things like this. So it doesn't quite get explicitly at the desert palette question, but I, I do think that she was kind of always looking around and always paying attention and always in tune with different qualities of light, different sunsets, different architectures. Um, so, um, so, you know, I, I, I kind of like to think of her in, in the desert in the Southwest, but, but I'm not aware that she, she spent any good time there. Well, travel is part of our palette. So that's a great yeah. answer. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Really, really great question. Um, thanks to everyone in the audience who sent in questions. They were really, really thoughtful. Um, and a huge, huge thanks again to Jordan and Chloe for the wonderful conversation. Um, we'd also like to shout out Matt Connors, who couldn't be here today, but contributed so much to the book. Um, and thank you also to the team at Echo Press for their support um, for today. Before we conclude, um, I will pass it back to Chloe for a reading to wrap us up. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, Jordan and I talked about, um, I, I, you know, we, we were thinking about maybe something and, and I, I spent some time last night thinking about a poem that makes me think of Miyoko Ito and her work. And um, so I'm going to read this poem I've long loved called New Rooms by Kay Ryan, and I'll read it twice. New Rooms. The mind must set itself up wherever it goes, and it would be most convenient to impose its old rooms, just tack them up like an interior tent. Oh, but the new holes aren't where the windows went. New rooms. The mind must set itself up wherever it goes, and it would be most convenient to impose its old rooms, just tack them up like an interior tent. Oh, but the new holes aren't where the windows went. Thank you. Perfect. That was such a great way to conclude today. Chloe, thank you so much. Um, this has just been such a treat, such an honor. A uh, huge, huge thanks again to you both, Jordan and Chloe. Um, and again, Thank you to the team at Echo Press and to Matt for the amazing contributions to the book. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC and making these daily conversations possible, as well as for their support of our archive, which you can explore on our YouTube channel. The Rail has been free and independent for 23 years. A donation directly supports our writers, production staff, and operations here at The Rail, so please consider supporting our work. There's a link in the chat to donate. And uh, join us at 1 p.m. Eastern tomorrow for a conversation with the Center Internacional de Poesie in Marseille. Um, it's going to be a conversation with Alice Notley, Abigail Lang, um, Cole Swenson, um, and Mikael Bataya. Um, and you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thanks everyone so, so much for tuning in today. Yeah, I just, I want to thank you guys again, <laughs> Chloe and Eleanor, Carolyn, Fong, just to be a part of this series is really, um, really moving to me. I just so appreciate the work the rail does.
I didn't guess to ask my question. <laughs> <laughs> I I was I was caught in the a uh, phone conversation. I meant to ask a question about Catherine Dreyer, the collector in Chicago, quite a bit. But we'll, we'll talk in person. Okay, Jordan, thank you so uh, much. Yes, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Uh, the show was staggeringly profound. Definitely. So Great. congratulations again. Thank you for coming on. And thank you also, Chloe, for the reading. And yeah, yes, it's awesome. Long live Ito. <laughs> well said. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks, Thank you. For Thank you. 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 Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, Jordan. Everyone, have a good Wednesday. Thanks, Jordan. Absolutely. Congratulations. Thank you. On the book. It's so beautiful. Congratulations on the book. Absolutely. See you Thanks. soon. Okay. Have yes. a great, great afternoon, Jordan. Thanks. Bye, GT. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Lynn.